Okay, let's start. Not that I'm the moderator, I'm just the oldest of nine. Huh? I said I'm not the moderator, but I'm the oldest of nine. Oh, I thought you were going to say, I think I'm the oldest here, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you gave me the ring. That's right. Not that I could. I'm happy to have lived long enough to say I'm 67, so whatever. 71. <laughs> okay, all right, you win. <laughs> <laughs> I rarely Should get to I say that. Should I be between these yeah. two? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's tell everyone a little bit about ourselves. You start. Thanks. <laughs> uh, my name is Jessica Feinberg. Uh, I'm a local author and illustrator. I work in a variety of different types of books. Uh, and I think I got put on this panel because I'm that person who has an idea, thinks there's no way I could ever do it, and doesn't even realize they're thinking about it, and then a year later sees the entire book in their head with the cover and the back, because I'm very visual. I'm like, I know what the first page is gonna be, I know what the last page is gonna be, I know what size the book is gonna be. Uh, so I do a lot of subconscious writing while I'm, and, and I'm, I guess we're gonna talk a lot about how to how to do that, how to relax and let your brain come up with that stuff. Yes. Hi, I'm Linda Addison. My latest book, Place of Broken Things. Most people has it. Um, I am so amazed at this panel concept. But anyway, I've been, <laughs> I've been writing um, unconscious, I want to say subconsciously, forever. I've written a lot of poetry and published a lot of poetry and won awards and everything. But anyway, fiction was always the one I had to work on. And then all of a sudden, the beginning of 2017, that started coming like that. And I was like, ha, OK. <laughs> if it's not a brain tumor, I'm going to take this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how it works. Well, mine's is different from yours, but anyway. Well, I'm Gloria McMillan, and thank you very much, Linda. You, I have read some of your books, and <laughs> I have not of yours, but I will after today. Oh. I'm very You're impressed so by what you say. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I'm so all over the map. I can't tell you, folks. I'm an artist. I'm a playwright. I'm a writer. I'm an editor, and I'm, right now I'm going to be a playwright today. <laughs> We're going to do a satire in the next with that one. And I'm still taking people volunteering to read for that. It will be in the panel one, panel room one. So being in so many areas, my brain just keeps switching back from visual to, and, and you know, some days I have to say visual in the morning, writing in the afternoon. Have you ever done that? Or I actually, I, I do a lot of, um, people ask me how I get so much done because I'll put up, out up to three or four books a year. Mm -hmm. And it's because uh, I understand how left brain, right brain works. So there Tell are, me. there are, <laughs> well you have your logic brain and your creative brain. So if you learn as a creator which tasks to tax, which one of those things, yeah. you can optimize your time. Mm -hmm. So I'll learn that if I have writing that or, or even planning out artwork that's very planning intensive, very logical, if I'm doing outlines for a book, if I'm doing a spreadsheet for a card game and what the cards are gonna be, those things obviously use my logic brain. But if I've already got a bunch of drawings that are sketched or in ink and I'm just painting them, that's more like a coloring book for me because I've already done the hard part. So I've learned if I kind of split my day between those things, uh, I get a lot more done. And when I started out, because I'm a small business owner and I do this all myself, uh, I would get a Kickstarter finished and think, I have to mail everything as fast as possible. And I learned very quickly that if I do more than three hours of mailing, signing and mailing books, I start making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> So I had to really learn like how to optimize the different ways my brain works and what I can handle in a day. Um, when you get old, you learn to do everything in the morning because your brain either side switches on. <laughs> After about one, you go into low sugar diet. Anybody else? I eat every that? two hours. That, that helps. That's the only way I keep going. Right, but I, you know, if I have to think about something. Also, another thing that helps is if you walk around the dining room, that helps you to think. Because you get more air to your brain. So I um, just daydream all the time. I think I've said this before, that even for me to stay present in reality is a journey. <laughs> so poetry has always been going through my head my whole life. And um, a, a little story, I'm a big daydreamer. 
Um, my report cards all said to my parents in elementary school, she'd get better grades or she just didn't daydream so much because they'd be talking about something I'm looking out the window thinking, what if that bird had longer legs or that cat had wings? I was, you know. So um, then I, when I won an award, my first award, my high school had me come back to give the speech to the graduating class. And they had like a little tea party in the library and everything. And they were like, wow, Linda, you did so great. All these books, this is an award. And I was like, yeah, how do you like the daydreamer now? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought for a while there was something maybe not right with me because poetry is just going through my head all the time. I'm looking at you guys and thinking poetry. So um, for me, it was just a matter of writing down whatever's going through my head all the time. I actually had a, a similar experience. I had a really bizarre childhood, so I would escape into my head, and mm. I would just make up stories. And I'm finally at the point now where a lot of the, the stuff I write is more on the guise of like a scientific field guide to a dragon or fairy. But I'm, I'm actually about to put on my first book of short fairy tales. I'm very nervous about this. Uh, but a lot of those have been stories that I've had in my head since I was 10 years old. I just make up, it's how I fall asleep. And I know some people, they think about stories, they stay awake. I do it to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I got accused of just, you know, never, I mean, I, I can't sit still, so I'm always doodling. And I get accused of doodling in meetings and getting in trouble. And finally, I realized I should just do that for a living. And then I wanted to get in trouble. <laughs> See, I work in corporate. Um, America until I retired. So um, people used to sit next to me in meetings and read my notes well, when because I would make poetry out of the. <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, when are you publishing these? I want to read these. And and people would be like, oh yeah, we can sit next to Linda because she's going to make sense out of this crazy. But I had a lot of meeting. people tell me I didn't think right when I lived in LA. I was in a three-year relationship, and he came out and said, "You think great? You should go see somebody about that because." Quite often, I think in narration, like I'm narrating a movie of what's happening around me, and then I started to meet a lot of other writers, and like that's not that uncommon for weird creative people, but I guess for I think we're all on the spectrum. I think that's like, <laughs> oh, so, someone created this on the spectrum thing, and I was like, oh, there, there I am. <laughs> that makes sense now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, girl, I'm never going to be mad at people thinking, doing I was themselves. Thinking, no, no, see, I was thinking maybe if I got one knee up, I could sort of be <laughs> at various heights. You do a knee up, some people do a knee down, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, yes, um, because I, I'm like sinking here. Um, what was I going to say? I was so concentrating on hydraulics here. <laughs> Anyway. Did your subconscious come up with anything while you well, were doing that? Yeah. Well, like mine yeah. did. <laughs> Hydraulics. My, my subconscious is telling me that, um, yeah, I, I believe differently because I'm in academia. That's why you see me behaving as strangely as I am. Uh, Hard that, to notice in this group. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to go to these meetings that would be like the spring conference of the English department at the U of A, and they would have these overly pompous speakers speakers that they'd fly in from Harvard or somewhere. One of them came and he just dumped a whole bunch of books out of his briefcase and obviously hadn't prepared, you know. And he said, I know I'll find a talk in here somewhere. And I was sitting there and I went because I was into computers and I thought, well, maybe, um, you know, finally they won't be so prejudiced against numbers and computers. It's a terrible rivalry. Uh, and his speech actually was like a, a revivalist about Numbers are the children of the devil, and don't ever use numbers. Wow. So, so, like, like English but you didn't let me get to my punchline. My punchline was, I'm going to have to stand. You do. My, my yeah. Stand on a chair. All right. <laughs> <laughs> my punchline was that I used that whole presentation because I'd taken a lot of notes. I was so angry at what he was saying, and I thought, this is really funny. And then I made him the victim in my murder mystery. Always <laughs> a good thing to do with anyone that pisses murder. you he off. Became, he became the victim. You That's know? a great yeah. way so. of saying, like, use your, you definitely use your emotional or your, I'd say, your instinctual and reactions the reaction to things. Have, yeah. Yeah. Can be some of the most powerful. I promise I sit sometimes, but I, I feel like You're, I'm not, I'm not that good. I don't know, I'm good. She's taller than either of us, so. <laughs> it's true. The only thing I need to do is not fall over. Yeah. We'll just hold it up. Uh, All right, maybe I can, sit I can sit on one wall. So I think a, a big tool towards uh, daydreaming, or now what they call subconscious or unconscious writing, for me has been journaling. I started journaling in 69. 
And what that did is I just wrote anything and everything that occurred to me. A word, an interesting word, a line I heard, a conversation. I miss here a lot, which is awesome. And <laughs> I write down whatever I miss here. So I think journaling for me has been the main way I've been able to take whatever's going on in my brain and then later turn it into writing. Um, all the collections I've done, and I've done maybe five or six, um, I always go back to my journals when I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm ready to write a book. And I start with wherever the date is that I finished the last book. And then I go through the journal and I find bits, pieces, words, lines, and um, I call them seeds. And then I'll sit and I don't plan out writing. The only time I plan out writing is someone's like, I would really like a poem about rainbows. I'm like, okay. And I plant the words in my head because I believe all I believe that all writing comes from the subconscious, superconscious, not from our conscious. I'm walking down the streetness, for me anyway. And so I plan it, and then sleep, do something else, write something else, and then it comes back up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I write down. So I think journaling, if you're interested in seeing how your subconscious work is a perfect way to do it. And, and journaling means not editing, writing anything, no matter how bad. I have one after one divorce that I'm not sure I can go back to. I may burn it, I'm not sure. <laughs> I keep thinking, well, you know, when I'm gone, do I care? I don't know. So, <laughs> um, so I think journaling is a big, um, whether you do it on your phone or if you do it with paper. So if you're talking about you, you see the seeds. How do you store it or organize it? What do you do with I it? I don't. I just write everything down. But then, then you go back and I go see back, everything? but I don't try to put myself in the place that I was when I wrote it. And, and don't I just see if soon. something happens. Like um, what's that one? The one that sparks joy to close to get rid of stuff. Marie 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't go back and try to put myself in that place. I just go back to the journal, and when something when I feel an energy in me for that, then I'll sit and I don't try to re repeat it. I just try to let that spark. So you just constantly look through. Yes. And if you're if you're familiar with the artist way, um, they have something called morning pages, which is almost for many. I don't know what time of day you journal, but for a lot of people, all journaling the time. You know, all the time. It's either all <laughs> the time or the end of the day. The morning page is something you have to write three pages, and they recommend you can't do it on the computer. You've got to do it in a notebook every day. And uh, I found it fascinating. I actually took one of the artist way workshops when I lived in LA. How many people struggled with that to the point that my teacher said, you're gonna go home, you're gonna do this, and you're gonna write your ABCs over and over again every morning until you learn to let go because they were so worried about are they writing the right thing. Making and sense. When probably. you do morning pages, you're just putting whatever crap you wake up with in your head on that piece of paper. But What's fascinating to me about that is they flat out tell you in the artist's way you're not allowed to reread those for at least three months. Mm. And you have a totally different perspective three months later. I have a journal that I fill with just everything, drawing, because from when I was 13, journals. and I look back at the, well I saved one when I was 13 though, which is, which is, I'm 38 now, so it's still a distance, and I realize how much of the stuff I thought was wrong with me is actually what allows me to create now, mm. and I'm so glad, like, I'm save stuff for a while, even if you feel like you might burn it. I mean, you can, I, I haven't kept every journal. There's some it's stuff that, that was one. just repetitive stuff, but um, seeing that actually did help me do this book, which I originally did with really bad drawings as a 10 page book when I was 14 years old. This is like, this is like all this time later. I actually posted what I did at the Dragon Cow in this book as I drew it as a 14 year old and everybody asked if it was a fan of mine doing a bad version of my art. I was like, no, that was me. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if I could have a word because not everybody likes to do journals and I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I consider the brain and the memory to be a fish tank. And when I was teaching English at, at U of A and FEMA, I would tell students that your, your memory is like a fish tank and you can't get instant and most of what I write from is memory also, but I don't do journaling. It's, it's not something I tend to do. When you're looking at your memories, the students would be sitting there and they would say, but I can't remember anything. And I, I would say, it's just like, as if you were little, you had little fish and they take a while to surface, you know, like in a fish tank. 
you have to sit with your memories for an hour or two, and then they will start to come up. And that was the metaphor. That was the method. I love that. that. I, you like that? I do. I, I, although I can't journal. I mean, I just have a. I can't remember. Then in my brain, my brain goes to it. And if they're bad memories, and they like the dead fish. That's yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, the idea of the, the panel is for, yeah. for us all to yeah. say stuff, and then you and decide what you want to try. I think <laughs> meditation. Uh, I mean, there's mm. there's so many books and different types of meditation. You meditation and trans journey. I learned to trans journey about 15 years ago. And that's a great way for me to kind of put myself outside of something for a project if I just get, like, I can't figure out what I'm supposed to do next. The key um, is to sit quietly. In our culture, we're always expecting instant input. Instant, you know, turn on a switch. But I would tell them, you know, if you're thinking about writing about your second grade, you have to sit quietly. And that's very hard for people, so what you're saying you're, you're doing meditation, the same thing, but you're yeah. calling it meditation. I'm just saying the same thing with but no, the no label. the thing is not all meditation is silence and sitting. Some people can't do it. And yeah, I, I do moving meditation, meditation because walking, that's what I do. Well, walking. you don't have to sit, but yeah. I mean, just be quiet with yeah. your memories and yeah. not be piling new things in. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Gloria Steinem in her book on self-esteem talks about how, like, if we stop doing something, we're mm -hmm. afraid we'll disappear, that we're not real. Mm -hmm. And now that's a hurdle we have to overcome. <laughs> what's, the, what's the name of the book? <laughs> no, no, I just want to write down her words. Like, if oh, I stop thinking, I'll disappear. I my self-esteem, which I can't remember which one it is, but, um, <coughs> gosh, give me a minute. I might be able to give you a page on it. <laughs> just writing the words <laughs> down as you were saying. That's, a, that's yes. a really cool idea, way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely have had experiences with Sitting quietly teaching. with with the stuff going on in your head, the, the way that the neurobiologists are, are now finding is that, you know, storage methods in the brain, in fact, being on <coughs> Facebook can actually affect the way that you remember. It's called um, learned erasure, I think is the thing. It, and you have these storage, storage uh, <laughs> levels in your brain. Here's, here's what goes on. You know what memes are. When yes. you get a meme that's, you get a I've whole- I've been a meme. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when, you meme. Get, when you get a whole stream, like a, like waterfall of these, and say they're a hate, hate waterfall against one group, you may have known someone that you really loved as a friend, maybe it was only in grade school, but you have a counter thing. But the more of these things floating, flooding down on you, it gets stored lower and lower until it's induced erasure. I'll have to look up if you want the exact title, but this is a clinical, psychology title for this syndrome and it's due to social media and, and Facebook and all these and you'll see it now during the, the cycle we're going to be going into this has actually it affects people's brain and their memory so be very careful when you're watching all one side over and over because you may have memories that counter that but they will get erased they will be lower and lower in priority until they're gone and subconsciously you're storing all that negative stuff because you, you've yeah. looked at it and without a doubt and that's 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 why i said for me mm -hmm. everything's happening somewhere that i don't see and i i when i read a, a young years and years ago it made so much sense to me the <coughs> shared consciousness because there's so many stories like i love reading different cultures japan africa mm -hmm. Uh, all these different Ireland, and you read the, the fables of these cultures, there's such similarity. So there's something to me that makes sense in this shared... Um, Fish tank. Induced <laughs> forgetting. It's called induced forgetting. That the, the clinical psychologists call this induced forgetting due to media exposure to hate memes. Yeah. So I think, again, in general, what we're all giving to you is concepts and approaches and some awesome words that are going to turn into poems. And, uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for induced forgetting to be a poem. That is what's like happening. Perfect. Right now it's happening. <laughs> and um, you have to just find the place that, and try different things. I've been trying different things forever. I think the important thing about allowing the subconscious to give you these wonderful ideas and as you put stuff in and it comes back up again is to not engage the editor to not engage the logical yeah. mind, to so write ego. or well, you can have a whole nother panel on what ego's about, but <laughs> you know, to allow it just to come out, that's why for me, because I'm, I have a thing about my memory, mm -hmm. 
that I write everything down that comes, these words. I mean, I could literally, anyway. So um, the way, I just want to talk about the way this book was written because this is the latest one that I did with Alessandro Manzetti. He's in Rome, I'm here, we're doing this book together. We're awake two hours each day at the same time, okay? So, and we had a, a deadline, we had to turn this in. We had five weeks. We wrote 33 poems in five weeks. So this is how I did it. Because I don't usually write that fast necessarily. Um, I did do 100 poems in three months once. But again, what, I, what he and I agreed to do is Whatever occurred to us, the first stanza, we would send to the other person and say, do you want to play with this? Meaning, does that stanza give you some images, something that makes you want to write something? And so a third of the poems in here we did together, a third he did and a third I did, but a lot of the ones I did were what I call written in response to a poem he wrote. And because he would write a poem, and I've done this a lot, and I didn't want to write in that <coughs> form, but I ended up writing a poem very similar in form with a different view on the theme that he wrote in there. That sounds like the Surrealists, and they did this thing called the Exquisite Corpse, you know about oh, that? Oh, yes. And, and Aleatory, all you know, Aleatory was chance, and, and they, they tried to do anything to break their ruts that our minds are on track. And that exactly To break down like the editor, to break yeah. down the logic, because uh, and I, I mentor and teach workshops with young writers, meaning people who are just starting writing, I'm the age. And I, I usually start the workshop with, we're gonna do writing seeds. This is similar to, I think, what has come up. And what I'll say is, take a piece of paper, we're gonna write for three minutes. I just want you to keep the pen moving. I don't care if it's numbers, dates, animals, just keep it moving for a page. And then in the workshop, uh, it's a poetry workshop, not just for poets, then we start talking about a poem. And you just start with something short like a haiku. And I say, you can go back to your seeds. And this is how, this is a great exercise to see how your subconscious works. Because you were just writing whatever came. But now you're gonna sit down and take something from that, like from a journal, and make something out of it. And that's where that's you find this wonderful, right. surprising thing that comes from the fish tank. I well, that. I have another one that comes from acting and theater that we turned into a writing. Howard Allen came to my class. He's a local theater reviewer and script doctor. You know Howard? Anyway, um, he said there's, a, there's an exercise they always use with actors where you're supposed to close your eyes and you envision fog, nothing but fog. It's a, it's a whole sea of fog. And again, you have to sit with it. Who's coming out of the fog? Ooh, I like that. You like that? I love that. And then, then more and more detail. What is that person saying? Is it someone you know? Is it a human? Who's coming? And, and you're writing, but in a writing class, then you start writing. Which yeah. is which is really similar to a lot of meditation exercises. Because you it's often a door, and it's you open the door. What does the passage look like? And where does it go? And who's right. at the other end of it? And so these all just open up to whatever's in there that you can't mm -hmm. you can't call it up. You can't get a hook and say, come out. You can't yeah. force it. <laughs> and it, you know. Right. Uh, yes, ma'am. A, a, a wonderful teacher of mine um, taught, taught us to do that with tarot cards. She said, do not buy a tarot book on how to read the cards. Sit with a card, look mm -hmm. at it, enter the borders, converse with whoever's, whatever's in there. That, and that way you find out what it's all about. Yeah. And there's a lot of oracle deck meditations. Yeah, I have a lot of decks too. And I don't know, uh, whoever's friends with me on Facebook and, and Twitter, you'll know that I've been doing these poems for the last five years called Life Poems. And what they were, what they are is I don't rewrite them. I do meditation, I do Tai Chi. When I'm doing meditation, whatever, and I can do sitting meditation quiet, <coughs> but I also just try to think of every movement, every thought, everything I'm doing is meditation. I didn't mean literally sitting. You, you know, that was metaphor, folks. <laughs> but I mean, just quiet. Yeah, the quiet yeah, mind. Just, just be quiet with <clears throat> so, the life poems come out of meditation because um, uh, I don't do a very long one, but just concentrating my breath, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And then whatever appears in my mind is what I'm working on that day. So, my life poems are not me standing on a podium going, and I know this, and you should all be doing this. No, it is what I realize I want to work on that day. 
that is a thought that I need to work on. And so the life poems, which I am going to turn into a deck, it's going to be fun, um, uh, are not rewritten. They're simply whatever occurred to me that day. So, so, so yours are coming out of what Ray Bradbury did and what a lot of theater people do is you hear voices talking in a conversation to each other and you may only hear a snatch of part of a sentence, and then you say, who is that voice talking to? You are in my brain too hard. So what <laughs> happens when I write poetry my whole life is that I'll sit, I like, you know, incense sometimes, or Miles Davis in the background, I can't have music with words. Okay. And then I'll start writing, mm -hmm. and then when I finish a poem, um, and I do rewrite some poems, some come almost perfect, but a lot of them I rewrite. Use thesaurus is a lot, because I tend to use the same words and I don't want to in the final. And then I finish and I read the poem and I'm like, damn, this is good. And I'm like, okay, yeah, put my name on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, I think it just, uh, it's a practice to do and it's worth doing if you're a writer, if you're an artist. I think it's worth just allowing yourself to just play. And I, I tell people, like we're learning art too, uh, if you're keeping a sketchbook, whether you're doing that as a learning tool or as planning out drawings or paintings you're going to do, and it's the same way if you're keeping a journal or a note, writing notebook, it's just for you. Uh, the hardest thing that, that I've found that blocks people from doing this type of writing is they're worried about doing it right. The editor, the logic. You gotta yeah. leave the editor and the logical brain outside the room and go, I'm just gonna play now, I'm gonna daydream. And then that, I believe it should come in when you, when you do work that you want to actually have other people read. Uh, the life poems are the only ones, like I said, I don't edit because I just, you know, and they're very short. I didn't write this book, but when I was teaching, she was a psychologist at Pima. It's called Conquering, I think the word conquering is used, Conquering Your Writing Anxiety by Cynthia Arum, A-R-E-M. And one of her exercises, I used to give extra credit if all my blocked writers would do her exercises. One was draw a picture of your writer's block. What kind of animal Ooh. is it? You, know. Girl, you are full of it. <laughs> 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 in the uh, best uh, way. I'm full of it, right? The you know, exercise in the best that's way. sort of similar that we did in the, uh, the artist's way class. It was probably the yeah. most powerful thing I've ever seen happen is they had us write down not just your writer's block, but what that critical part of your mind was saying, and people write down, what's it saying? You're oh, gonna yeah. fail, she you can't do this, you only write poems. Like that, yeah. And then what they did is, they took one lady's, and they had us all stand around her and shout her insecurities at her until she started That's crying. Right. Scripts. She started crying. This is, and this is a script that you run in your yeah. head. And they took her off to the side, and they talked to her for five minutes, and she came back and she handled it perfectly. And what they taught us was, don't yell at that part of yourself. That part of yourself doesn't hate you. That part of yourself is protecting you. There's other ways, too. One thing is, you can make a list of these phrases that have been used by teachers, by parents, you can't write, you can't do math. Oh, you're so silly, I, I would have known that in third grade. You write them down, and then you come up with, I handled this, and this was difficult, and I managed it. Why, I could go back and do writing too. And, or you can just revise them. I haven't done it yet, but I can. See, that's what I, I, what I love about um, doing the poetry workshop <coughs> that I teach, and I, and I say it's a form workshop, not just for poets. And some of the best poetry that's come out of it is people who've never written a poem before. Because, you know, again, the starting with writing seeds, I don't know that a lot of people think about that. That you can just, that what comes without you thinking can be so powerful for you to go back to and build on. I've heard of it as yeah. word pooling, which yeah. I guess is a similar thing. I think a lot of your decision to be your and then, you know, you go into theater that's a collaborative art, and I'm trying to figure a way to get that little wedged into the conversation here because it's not all what's going on in my one brain. When you get into theater, then you're dealing with other subconsciousnesses, and they, they insist on putting their input, and in fact, Howard has the Collaborative Storytelling Institute. Nice. And, and, you can, and he's on Facebook, and you can friend him. Good old Howard. I mean, and, and that's one of the things we people that like theater for that reason. We, we hear our own voices a lot, and then it's interesting to, to turn into group mind or hive mind. I guess that's what I like about theater. It gets to be like a hive mind where you no longer feel like it's all in my head. It's, it's socially constructed art, yeah. which is only constructed in, in the group. Yeah, I have <coughs> no uh, drama background other than being dramatic sometimes. <laughs> but um, 
I, uh, the, again, what I loved about doing this with Alessandro is that English is a second language for him. <coughs> and I've read his poetry before, I love his work. And he uses words in a way that I would never think of. Yeah, you see what I'm And I literally about, yeah. think this is the best work I've done because it's the latest work I've done. Because he inspired me with words he did. And um, you know, I would give him feedback, like, did you mean this word? 80% of the time, not so much, but yeah, yeah. you know, but it was very inspiring to but me. you could have never thought of something. Exactly. And, and that's um, exactly it. After I did the Earth's Way workshop, I actually got to go to a sign and meet you after I got to meet Julia Cameron. And the coolest thing she said that stuck with me for the past 15 years is that she had just come back from a book tour in the UK. And she said, it's really interesting in the US, if you tell someone a writer, one of the most common questions they ask you is, what kind of writer are you? But she said when she was in the UK, if she said she was a writer, people would assume that she could write fiction novels and poetry mm -hmm. and play. And she had done all of those, and yeah. that doing all of those different things, like if she wrote poetry for a while, it improved her novels. And, and that's how I do the workshop. I tell people, you can use what I'm teaching in the workshop. Very true. If you're a fiction, I had a journalist in it once. Uh -huh. Oh, how to use How to use this concept of taking words and turning them into poetry and so I don't believe in block, writer's blocks. No. It doesn't work for me. I don't understand the concept. It's fear. <laughs> Basically, writer's blocks are fear. Someone instilled fear in a, in a would-be writer in an earlier, maybe childhood. And I've seen people who were, I mean, I've, I've taught, you know, 27 years, 30, I don't know. And I have encountered these people, and they insist, they're terrified. You know, you're, you're going to make me, you know. So I, I also think that part of a uh, writer's block is that sometimes work is not ready and you can't mm -hmm. force it. Right. I mean, we kind of got on a treadmill with this because we had a deadline. <laughs> but the treadmill was like, you know, I would wake up at three in the morning because I've taught myself to do lucid dreaming too. Mm -hmm. And you can teach yourself to do this, believe me. Um, we can talk about it outside if you want to. but. And I would come, I would see an image, a line, a word, or something, and I love words. I could literally spend all day just looking up oh, a yeah. word and then create like poetry Same from here. it. And I would wake up at three with this. I'd go to my office, write down whatever I had, and then go back to sleep and send it to, to Alessandro. <laughs> he did the same with me. So that's how, I mean, it's very intense. I don't think I could do it like for a whole year where I was just constantly dumping it out. And the theme, when we talked about the theme, I gave him a title, because I have a document full of titles. <laughs> like, I think this erasure thing is gonna become something induced to get it out of that. It's um, induced for getting Yeah, I love if it. If you wanna look it up, what you think. And uh, so I gave him this title, so when we talked about how we were gonna, what is the theme of the book, <coughs> and I said, anything that has the, or place, or broken, or thing <laughs> in it, <laughs> I'm good, let's do this. Yeah. So we started with that open space, and what we ended up with is, I feel like every poem in here is approaching what it is to be human, but in a weird surrealistic way, mm -hmm. and what it is to be human, and what it is to have things, and when they break, and what places, and it really all does still come together, right. because we just were like, could I give you a seed that came out of my study of Hebrew and uh, it was more Yiddish, okay? <laughs> I was studying Yiddish and I was studying Greek. I just decided, you know, I want to know the Greek alphabet and the little uh, basics of Greek. And then I decided, hey, why not Yiddish too? And, and then I, I put up a website with letters. I was so happy I was doing it. And then I dropped it, I was done. But about a year or two later, I had a dream. And in this dream, there was a TV screen and, and these words came up, you know, like in a magic eight ball that you can't oh, clear. Yeah. And it said, you will get surus. And I went, surus, T-S-U-R-I-S, or something like that. And then I thought, you know, that sounds like maybe one of the words from, from Yiddish. And I looked it up, and it meant trouble. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really was a Yiddish word, you know. It yeah. came up in my, and, and I haven't used that in fiction, yeah. but that, you see how that's, uh, that was more an example yeah. of how your memory works. I think yeah. when you're talking about the having time to like sit with yourself, I think a lot of people who struggle with subconscious writing, they don't allow, I would almost talk, it's not even having space. If your life is so filled with, and it, it's very common in our culture in the US to like, I've got to get 
through the line of the supermarket as fast as possible. I gotta tailgate and get to the place as fast as I can go. If you don't give yourself downtime for that subconscious part of your mind to do things, for you to absorb information from the world around you, to go to an art gallery or a poetry reading and have these new things happening to you, mm -hmm. If you're just go, go, go all the time and then you're exhausted and you pass out, you don't remember your dreams, that's not going to happen for you. You have to give yourself the space and time for these stories to form. And, and I'm going to add sense. another piece to that, and that is I think it's important to be present, that's which right. is why I say now everything's meditation for me. Because I love being present in a space, in here. You know, the, the energy coming from all of you as you're listening to us, if, you, if something's hitting you. Just being present, you're picking up a feeling, an emotion, a reaction to something. And if you're not present, then you're missing out on something. And that's why I write everything that's down, because right. I have the worst memory. Yeah. I learned <laughs> early, like I would wake up and be like, this is a great idea, and then like two hours later, I'm like, what was that? Yeah. You know, I so. Know. You know, this, this is a thing, thinking about <coughs> conventions. I have a hard time at conventions. I'm gonna be uh, full disclosure here. I have to limit what I go to, and I have to myself I do that too, because though. it's so overwhelming this all yeah. of this washes of me many strong many interesting personalities and, and they're handing you their cards and and I can't deal with it you know and some people are why, why didn't you go to that in that party and I'm thinking, well yeah I, I had my I hit my you know, and that's limits. The, yeah and the thing is like I love being social as some of you know mm -hmm. who have been around me for a hot minute but what I do after this is I'm gonna go back to my house on Speedway, and I'm not going to talk to anybody. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just going to get up and have my coffee and write and stuff. So I also need quiet, and even add things like this. Like I need to go to my room sometime and just sit. So it, it's really important to allow space again for the subconscious to give you wonderful things that it's really waiting for. So one of the exercises that I've I've given <coughs> because I've done it myself. I do share what I've actually done, and it's helped me with this concept of writer's block, because years and years and years ago, I used to think that was such a thing, for me it's not, is that I will sit, I just lost my train of thought. Lord, After a lot of input, you sit, uh, when it's coming at you, yeah. Yeah, and then I'll just write down, like, reaction again, just reaction, you know. Um, whatever the words are that come to me, I just write them down. Later, again, I think, that, again, the idea is that you're putting this stuff in, this wonderful conscious thing, and when it's ready to come, because like I said, you can't force anything unless you have a deadline. <laughs> Sometimes then you kind of, yeah, the adrenaline gets you going, and you're like, ah. But um, you allow it to come when it's ready to come. So again, forcing something, I think, for me, if I try to force something, unless I'm in it, like we really got in, as Alessandra and I got into a thing. We were like, yeah, you know, we got into a crazy, wonderful space that was very intense. But if you're working, for me, if I'm working on one thing, and that's, I feel stu like I feel empty. That's what I call it, empty. That means my subconscious has got nothing else for me right now. Then I go to something else. Because then, while I'm into something else, the subconscious, oh, I know what I was gonna say too. So what I tell people is, you know, when people are like, I can't write, I don't have time. I'm like, if you sit down every day and you say from five to 5.15, I'm gonna write. You sit in the chair, nobody else comes in that room for 15 minutes, and if you only write one word, that's what I tell uh, people I mentor, one new word a day, set that as your expectation. I'm not good with, I'm gonna write 4,000 words today. That doesn't work for me. It works for some people. One new word a day, guess what happens? You're gonna do more than one word. And what's gonna happen also is your subconscious is gonna go, oh, I don't have to like wait for the music to hit. I'm gonna get a window every day. Trust and believe me, that's gonna work, even if it's five minutes. A, uh, a writer that uh, did a talk at the uh, Female Writers Workshop when that was running said when he would run into a situation like that. He'd just sit in, in his office and write whatever. He'd cover the yeah, screen. Nice. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just, you know, I'm sitting in my room, I'm looking at the walls, they're gray, you know, and, and just keep going in and stream of consciousness. Stream of consciousness to start and that but that would release him to then work on whatever it was he was actually trying to write. I'd like to bring up before we close, Breakfast of Camp Champions by Kurt Vonnegut, 
who not everybody has heard of anymore. And he was very good at this sort of thing. And in this book, he set his characters free. You know, he felt they'd been serving him so long. He also made many very not impressive drawings, <laughs> including an asshole that looks like an asterisk. But um, <laughs> 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 he, he has wide open beavers, you know, pornography drawings. And, and it's, you know, it, it, it's just where he's not only drawing on himself, but he's, he's ridiculing all the boxes that we are in as a society, not just me, but the whole commodified world of modern U.S. culture, he manages to get out of it by stepping back, doing these weird drawings, and I recommend it to anyone, because if you need to sort of, how do I loosen up and see the, the absurdity of it all, this book, I haven't looked at it in many years, and I've been talking about it. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, you know. Well, and I think this all ties into what you were talking about earlier with social media um, and putting yourself in boxes. Another thing other than memes that happens is in all these surveys, find out if you're an extrovert or an introvert. Yeah. Find out if you're visual or auditory. <coughs> and what I learned in a lot of workshops is that most creators are all of these things. Sometimes we need to be extroverted and take in a lot of stuff. Sometimes we need to be introverted. And while I am primarily a visual person, I will not remember your name if I have not seen it in print. <laughs> Even in print. I Even in print. Faces I remember. <laughs> I can tell you how to get anywhere That's by true. the visual things you see, but I can't tell you the street names. But there are times, like, if I'm stuck on something, I will then say, well, maybe I need to listen to music in another language I don't understand. Maybe I need to, if one of the best ways to get through blocks and I think access weird things in your subconscious is to change what type of stimulation you're getting. If you're getting a lot of visual stimulation, switch to something that, like, just feeling different fabrics in the fabric store or listening to different sounds can completely change and you how you're yeah, yeah, really present. So here's, here's a five-word poem that I wrote. I have to tell you the story of this because I think it's somewhat relevant. I wrote a poem. I sat down to do my daily writing. Empty. Empty. I wrote, <clears throat> letters avoid words dreams dissolve. And I was doing a lot of haiku at the time, and I was like, well, this is kind of the shape of a senru, S-E-N-R-Y-U. So I sent it to Brussels Sprouts, which had published some of my haiku. The guy sends me back a letter, like literally almost a whole page. I love this. I love how it represents how, you know, you write love letters to someone you care about, and then the relationship doesn't work out, and your dream of the relationship is <laughs> I wrote, letters avoid words. My dream of writing just dissolved. <laughs> Sold it. Uh, and if you want to be really inspired by, by really short things, um, my favorite example of that is six word memoirs. Oh, yeah, I love those. when oh people do three word stories. Or six word stories, yeah. <sighs> Such a good thing. Yeah. I just wanted to mention uh, I'm the same with you. If there's a lyric, I can't write. But I, can. I listen to classical music or music without words, and I get so inspired. If I want to set a mood, I pick the music I want, and then it's just like. <laughs> See, I love Miles Davis for horror. I don't know why. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> <Wow. coughs> or the other one that I do, and I, I was never diagnosed as ADD, but here in this day, I think I did have it. <laughs> Nobody knew. Um, is that. <clears throat> I have a, a like a five uh, DVD player, and um, um, I'll put on like all the Alien movies in order yes. without the sound on because I know the dialogue by heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so you get the input. Yeah. So okay. like if I'm writing and I'm sitting and I'm thinking and I look and I, it's like visually that moving picture keeps me in a dark place. <laughs> Well, I don't know. When I'm coming up with a play idea, I go back to the conversations in my head between various parts of me that are fighting myself and people outside of me. And that's how I came up with this rock, the nuclear clock. I was thinking of Fritz Leiber and his, his whole way of looking at the world, another writer that people may, may not know I, anymore. I read a lot of and, and especially his book, A Specter is Haunting Texas, which is one of his lesser known books. It's a great Swiftian satire on the US and our imperialism in the world. Um, so he had this, this group of Shakespeareans, they were living in the stack. It's a circumlunar um, 
recreation entertainment satellite, and they have their own Shakespearean company orbiting the moon. And so I sort of started with that, and then I had a game show coming to my head that would be broadcasting from in this entertainment circumlunar satellite, and how it would be more rationalist than the way that we solve nuclear issues now. It would just be solved with a game show <laughs> and <laughs> called Rock the Nuclear Clock. And, and you know, like one thing just kind of went into the next, and, but a lot of it, I, I don't <coughs> really know this play yet. I wrote it, but I don't know it. I have never heard it performed. This will be the first time ever I will hear these words. And believe me, a play is different. It doesn't exist on paper. It has to be out there, and, and people have to be saying the words and, and getting into the characters, so I'm so excited. At one, I'm going to see. My play will actually exist at 1 o'clock today. Cool. I, I think, too, when you were talking about sometimes it's not the right time. Yeah. But that's also important, too. Um, I'm hoping to do a panel maybe with, I uh, probably keep you on next year, but with Liz Danforth about valuing your ideas. And I think that tie and valuing yourself as a creator, sometimes it's not the right time. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Um, right. Like, I have this idea for a book about dragon cows and dragon cats when I was 14, and I just couldn't execute it. So it sat there. But I didn't throw out the drawings. I had the drawings from when I was 14 in an old box in the closet. I went back to them. I, I want to say a fast word because she's going to want to write this word down. Kairos. Because my field is rhetoric. Is that with and a K or a C? K. K-A-I-R-O-S. And that is a very important principle both in creativity and in rhetoric. It means timeliness. The same sentence said to an audience would fall flat in 2018. You say it in 2020. Wow, you know, the whole place goes crazy. Yeah. Kairos and Aristotle thought of this in the 300 and something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, She's so, the best so doing the dragon stuff. Of your, <laughs> or Kairos of your mind, you know, <laughs> sometimes you'll think of things and it's not the time yet, then what you're doing is right. Because so, so don't throw those ideas the chirotic, away. The chirotic effect is different. I mean, and you don't know when it's going to come back and be meaningful. I wrote a story in 2000 that ended up in Dark Matter One, which was the first anthology of, of Black's writing, speculative fiction. That story really was from a novel I was trying to write. Then I was like, I, I'm scared. I don't know how to do a novel. So, I, <laughs> so from 2000 until 2017, I just did all these collections and got all this great attention, which is wonderful, and I, I feel blessed about it. And then 2017, I started writing. Was that the one, novel. What was that one that you were talking about a lot at the other convention, and it was making your friends, and that's the one I have at home with your enemies, becoming friends with your friends. Oh, yeah, the you book, know. How to Recognize a Demon is Become Your Friend? Yeah, it's something like that, yes. Yes, I think, you, I mean, I, I actually, um, when I first moved to Tucson five years ago from New York, I thought, and I retired, I thought, oh damn, I'm gonna be writing like a fiend now, because I got no day job. I actually <laughs> literally had to sit for a year in my house and go back through my entire life. I didn't know this was gonna happen, because I kept trying to write and it just wasn't happening, and like I said, I don't believe in forcing it, unless you got a deadline and you pay for it. But I mean, <laughs> and so I sat for a year and went through my entire life, from beginning to end, reviewing everyone that hurt me and forgiving them, everyone I hurt and forgiving myself. And that's sort of, and of course I was journaling the whole time, but it was um, a place that sort of put me in a resettlement of my mind and my creative wild self of just falling in love. And I really feel like you have to love everything about yourself. You have to love your shadows, your good parts, your bad parts, if you're gonna create, because this is what we do. I as still, creative people. Well, that's what well, I was really saying about that critic you have. It isn't a bad part of yourself. So what no. they taught me to do is to acknowledge it and say, I know you're worried about me. Thanks for letting me know. I'm going to consider that, but I'm going to do it anyway. Another yeah. thing is what place your mind wants to be in. My mind will not write much about Tucson. I write about Chicago. I haven't lived in Chicago since 1973. But it's James there. Joyce. But it's James there. Joyce wrote about Dublin, and he lived in Trieste. 50 years that he never could write about. You don't see any James Joyce about Trieste. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of, again, everything's going in. You're sitting yeah. here, everything's <laughs> going in. Everybody you see, every time you go to the store, when you walk out of the house and when all that for me is going into my subconscious. 
and then we'll come back always yeah, as some something of the that's people, why I don't believe in writer's block. Some of the block. people here might, but I have to transport them to where, it, it's a funny thing with me, I realize that, I only know, I never felt I knew this place. I've lived here all, and, but I know back there, I really understood all the dynamics, so I might have elements from here, but I'll transport right. them there. So what, we're, what you're seeing here with the three of us is you just gotta do what works for you. Right. And sometimes what works with one book, you go to do another book and it's a different thing that's gonna work, that's gonna give you energy, that's gonna, want, that's gonna make you wanna write. So you have to be really, like, really gentle and love yourself and allow yourself to be as wild and crazy and daydreamy as you want. Trust and believe me, some good stuff comes. That's right. Any other questions? We got like a minute. I just want to make Six a comment. Minutes. When you said serifs, it just it touched of, of other languages, and when you have some knowledge of another language, there's this meaning that you get out of the word in the other language that's contextual, meaning it's, it's social or, or whatever background or religious that you have, that you just can't get out of English. Because I, I hear Cirrus, and I hadn't heard that word in maybe 30 years. Imagine how I surprised hear, I was. And I hear my <laughs> grandmother shaking her head, the queen bee, you know, going, Cirrus. Uh, uh, any, any addition so that I associate with my so when you say, So when you say words are important, that a word triggers. Yeah. God, I got that whole experience. I was watching your face. that one word. <laughs> oh, I saw you. <laughs> yeah, I could write a book on one word just looking it up. And and I think now, I mean, I'm very organic writer, so whenever I've been doing these panels I'm interviewed, I have to like try to make sense out of what's going on in this mind of mine. I think part of it for me was growing up, I grew up poor, there were nine kids in the house, we didn't have books. Someone gave us um, and I don't know if anyone's gonna remember this unless you're like over something. Uh, a dictionary that literally is like this big, paper thin like a Bible. And I, all I remember in my childhood is sitting on the floor with the sun coming through the window, looking through there and just reading one word, where it came from, how to pronounce it. <laughs> I bet you I'm had so like, crazy for I words. I bet you had like Webster's unabridged yeah. second edition yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Uh, and I'm really just so crazy yeah. for words, I'm telling you. I just love, love, and, love. And now like, people don't have them. I, was, I think I got rid of my last big dictionary about five years ago. Oh, I can't. I still have mine out. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's crazy. I know with the internet. But if I'm reading and um, I, I don't recognize the word, I don't go to the internet. I, you know, right now there's got like, there's all the stuff on it, but I'll clear it off and I'll go and I'll flip the dictionary and I'll look it up in there. Yeah, and another thing I do when I'm stuck writing and I want to feed the wild sea is there are some writers whose work I really like. I just like the music, the way they tell the story. And I have a pile of them around me all the time. And I'll just sit and flip to a page, pull a few words out, and I'm going. You know, again, it's just making friends with that wild seed, wild mind that you have. And then, yes, then you can say, okay, editor and critic, come in, let's make sense out of this. Let's shape it, I should say, in some way, if you want to sell. I've met writers who are amazing writers. I happen to think probably better first writers than I am. They're not interested in selling this stuff, so, okay. Um, and it, the book I would recommend, uh, and I hate instructional books on writing, I don't know what that is, like it was my teenage self rebelling, but uh, the reason I'm a writer and artist now is that when I was 16 I got mono and I couldn't do anything for, we didn't know I was sick for like eight months. I was actually still trying to like work full time as a 16 year old uh, because I was homeschooled. And so I got so sick I couldn't do anything for like a year and a half. And crazy happenstance, my mom got me a book called Poem Crazy. One word. I have that book. Isn't I love book? that book. So if you, I've given that book right. as a gift. <laughs> I give it up as a gift too. If you want a book that will make you see words in a completely new and different way, it's by a woman named Susan Woolridge. Yes. And she actually has a second book called Fool's Gold. That like 10, 15 years later. I haven't finished later. with the one I got. Um, I've been working that thing She for years. teaches poetry um, to like juvenile delinquents and like a whole bunch of other types of people, but just fascinating person and. The way she makes you think about words, she got me considering, well, what color is an emotion? What does an emotion smell like? And that shaped how I was gonna write the rest of my life. So what, what is the title again? Poem, poem crazy. crazy. And it's one word. There's no space in it. Oh, and I such like, a good book. would recommend it for every type of writer because it just changes the way you think about words. And it's not a long book and it's not a hard read. 
And I think her second book is called Fool's Gold. I, I have a, a fast uh, recommendation, and this is more about when you can get all the words out and you can get characters in your mind. Many of us start falling down at that part. And this one is called How to Write Plots That Sell by F.A. F. F. Rockwell. And it's very good because it, it, it has all kinds of sources and, and different ways to stu structure a plot, different places, get your plots from news, get it from the National Enquirer, get it from the Bible, get it from old stories that you've heard, legends, and different chapters on all of this. But then how to do the structure of the ups and downs of actually plotting. Most people can come up with the characters. What they can't do is the pacing and the plotting. So, you know, that's part of it. You may not even do it while you're writing, but if you've read the book, you'll have some ideas. Well, I need a little bit more of a And again, that's because obstacle. to me, you're feeding your subconscious. You're giving us some right. good uh, stuff. Right. You're saying, and here's then if, something. If you're super stuck, I, I try to remember, I think there's two books, 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. Epiphany. Which are that one too. Two, I know, we're, we're, like, we're like sisters. Yeah, all of our books. Um, I really do. I'm which which is a time. series of writing prompts. And they're the best writing prompts right. that yeah. I've ever seen. And they're organized by what you want to improve. Mm -hmm. And they're weird writing prompts. My favorite one was Love like, there's a girlfriend who sneaks into her, boy, her ex-boyfriend's apartment because she's still got yeah, the keys. And it's while fun. she's there, someone else comes in, so she hides in the closet. And your writing prompt is to write what she sees while in the closet. And I mean, they're great props. They just get you totally out yeah. of whatever you Which thought you were really doing. Necessary. What was that? 3 a.m. Epiphany. And I think there's a sequel that's 4 a.m. Epiphany. You have the sequels. I can't get past the I don't first have books. Oh, first books are like everything for me. With, with Poem Crazy, that first book was when I had mono, and her second book was like almost 20 years later, and it was after I went through a horrible breakup and had just moved back to Arizona, and that book saved me. So oh, that's good. Nice. Before we go, I have my final, some of the people weren't here. Uh, Ray Bradbury's 100th birthday is coming up next August. They're having a month-long big celebration in Waukegan, but with all kinds of interactive things. There are, they're also opening the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. They're going to have film stars that were in his movies. You can sign up to be on the mailing list there. And I, I need a picture of the panel for you, somebody. <laughs> they, the woman oh from Waukegan sent me all this, so I figure we shouldn't be so localized that we can't know what's going on elsewhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for coming.